process. Um, and depending on how much time we have, we'll do a deeper dive, uh, relatively deep dive into uh, something that I call a project charter and a project charter document. And, uh, and then hopefully we'll leave enough time for, for questions and discussion. Uh, please feel free to ask questions as we go through. I'm, I'm imagining we can keep this fairly informal. Just ask questions. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. and by the way, there's PDFs of this that Aaron and I can send to you for these documents that support this presentation. So just let us know. Okay. Uh, so Aaron said I'm the uh, current president of the PMI uh, Houston chapter, which is actually a lie. <laughs> I was when we scheduled this, the president, but after three years, I've now been able to step back, and I'm actually the now past president, uh, but I'm the VP programs now for the, for the PMI chapter. I'll talk about who PMI is uh, in a few minutes, but uh, I'm sort of wearing two hats in a sense, so I'm, yes, I'm involved in PMI Tucson, and uh, I also, I think many of you, um, have my own company uh, doing project management consulting training. So PMI Tucson, uh, we have about 280 members uh, in the Tucson area. We're actually one of the smaller chapters around the country. Uh, Phoenix, for instance, has about uh, 2,400 members. There's some idea of, of scale. Um, but uh, that's growth over the past three years. We started uh, at about 180 members three years ago, so now we're up to about 280. And uh, we have three meetings a month that uh, we have a dinner meeting in Tucson, a breakfast meeting in Tucson, and also a, a dinner meeting in Sierra Vista. Uh, if you're interested at all, by the time we're done talking about project management, this is the, the website, and you can sign up there to be on the mailing list and receive event announcements um, so that you can, you can attend as a non-member should there be a topic that's of interest. Uh, something that may be of interest to some of you uh, is that uh, you, most of you here have some sort of expertise uh, that uh, you're looking to leverage uh, one way or another. And uh, we, since we have uh, three events a month, we are always looking for speakers. And uh, if you can uh, discuss uh, anything related to leadership, general good business practices, um, anything along those lines that would be of use to project management types, then uh, give me a call or send me an email and, and we can chat about whether uh, it makes sense for you to be a speaker at one of our events. So whether it be, uh, as I said, leadership, uh, marketing, as long as it's said it can be in some way uh, tied to something that project managers would find of interest, then there might be an opportunity for you to you know, get your name out there uh, to a, perhaps a slightly different group of people. Okay? Uh, key Consulting, so that, that's my other hand. Key Consulting I created in, in uh, 1999 uh, to provide project management, originally project management consulting services, now project management uh, training services as well. So um, we have now two classrooms, one here in Tucson, Broadway and Craycroft, another one in the Puget Sound area, uh, just outside Seattle, where we provide open enrollment project management training courses, anything from a day to a full week, a uh, variety of project management related topics. Um, I don't usually um, uh, sort of hold myself up as a small business expert, but um, as you can see, doing this for a while, so if there are any questions around small business uh, from that perspective, um, I'll be happy to, to answer those as well um, at some point. Let's see. Um, the, I, th I think there are going to be some PDFs available, right, uh, Brandon had just said. Uh, there are some of the templates that we're going to talk about today and others are available at the Keith's website uh, for download, so if you found anything useful uh, here today, you can download some of it from there as well. Not necessarily the presentation itself, but uh, some of the I guess just, just to give you a little bit more of a flavor for the types of things that I typically do, it's either uh, training, as I said, with open enrollment classes where anybody can sign up, going on site to, for instance, TEP, just down the street here, and doing an on-site uh, training there, or consulting. The consulting might take the, the form of helping on specific projects. So if an organization is having a particular challenge with a particular project, I might go in and uh, help them, or if they're having, uh, if they're wanting to improve the, the way they manage projects generally, um, their project management methodology, well, that's something that we might help out with as well. Okay, so my background then is, uh, is, is project management, and so I just want to start by clarifying, when I say project management, what does that really mean? Uh, 
Um, most of you will be involved in what I would call operational work and also project work. Operational work uh, has many similar characteristics to project work. These are some of them here. Right? It involves people, uh, we can do planning, we have stakeholders. But this, there, are, there are two things that, that characterize projects that are different from ongoing operations. Um, and those are the projects are uh, to some degree unique, doing something that has not been done before. Uh, and a project is something that is temporary and that has a defined end point. At some point, the, the project will come to an end. So, for instance, setting up this facility it was a project. Right? But at some point, it was set up, it was done, and then we moved into an operational mode where, yes, you know, we still need to, to bring people in, to show them around, we still need to uh, you know, make sure that somebody's paying the, the lights and, and those kinds of things, right? But that's more of an operational mode where that tends to be fairly repetitive and ongoing, uh, with no particular, you know, presumably, gang plank will go for as long as there's a need for it, and there's no particular fixed end point. Right? But setting up the facility, yes, there was a particular goal in mind to set it up by a particular day. Right? Does that make sense? Right? So my, my background then is the project piece, not necessarily the operational piece, not necessarily the ongoing or repetitive side of business, but the, these projects where we have something unique and different to do, and uh, there's at some point in the we say we're done, it's a final team, and it's over. And my particular background tends to be in the kind of more wild and crazy projects, the ones that are really unique, because I have a very varied background. I mean, certainly there are project managers who have spent 20 years in IT, so they have a lot of depth in, our, in IT projects, but have not necessarily worked outside of IT. Um, my strength, personally, is that I've worked on a lot of different uh, so I know nothing about any particular industry, um, but I'm able to, um, in a sense, demonstrate that I'd be able to walk into projects that perhaps nobody's ever done before and use these project management tools to bring a little bit of order to what was otherwise a chaotic situation. So, so even though uh, you know many of you are from different areas of IT, you should find what we're going to talk today useful, regardless of what particular um, area you're, you're most familiar. So the project management uh, piece then is if, if a project is something that's unique and uh, um, they're temporary, the project management piece then focuses on the, on the not on the technical, but on the project processes themselves. Right? So when I'm helping an organization manage a project, I'm not there to provide technical expertise in, uh, in IT or uh, astronomy or whatever it is that the organization, they have people there that don't have what they're struggling with is coordinating all the different pieces of the puzzle and making sure they get them all done in time. So project management is focusing on those project processes as opposed to the technical ones. Now many of you, if you're in a project management position or you're being asked to manage projects, will be uh, both a technical lead for the project and the project manager. And, and we could have a whole discussion about whether that is a good thing or a bad thing with the pluses and minuses, right? But from my perspective, they are two separate roles. Your organization may or may not always put them together, but they're really two different roles. One is providing technical direction to the project team, the other is providing project management direction. And they're different. So, um, and a lot of projects, um, some of, a lot of projects I get involved in are often because an individual has been asked to do both roles, and for whatever reason, uh, has fallen down or is having problems, often just because that's a lot of work to ask one person to do, right? And they end up getting stretched thin, they tend to focus on the, on the technical piece, the project management piece starts to suffer, hence they need to know. Okay. Um, but from my perspective, then, project management is on project processes, um, it, it's about uh, making sure that we're using people in an efficient and effective way, that we're um, able to measure where we are from a, a progress perspective and so forth. And we can usually divide it into a number of, uh, divide the processes into a number of different areas, and we'll be mentioning those briefly as we go. Describing the need for project management, um, the good news for me is that over the past 10, 15 years, more people have been recognizing the need for project management. And I'll show you a graph in a minute of membership of the national PMI organization that I think reflects that. Um, why has that been the case? Um, these are some of the reasons, I think. Um, firstly, because we're just trying to do bigger, more complicated things than we have in the past. 
projects are, are getting more complicated uh, as we incorporate more technologies. And so um, there's just more to be done, more um, ways the projects can fail, so you need better project management. Global competition has increased the need to be more effective. And um, this is true in, in many industries, right? And you're not just competing with somebody down the street anymore, you're competing with companies around the world. And so one of the differentiating factors is how good is your project management? Better access to information and communication networks. I don't know if you guys in MIT, but you know, there's a million and one different ways that we can communicate with each other these days. That lends itself to uh, project management, and so that's one of the reasons why doing project management. Customers are expecting more from their vendors. Uh, rapid rates of change. Uh, this is really uh, two, two separate bullets almost. One is the fact that um, with every new cell phone that comes out, right, that means there is new, new hardware projects, there's new software projects that need to be done, new marketing campaigns, maybe new towns that need to be put up. Uh, each new wave of technology brings with it a whole slew of projects that need to be executed. The other is that, um, and, and this, you may see this in your own lives, the way you go about doing work today is different than you go about doing, you may have gone about doing very similar projects five years ago. And the steps that you go through because of the technologies that are available are now different. So in a sense, projects are becoming more unique. Right? So um, to give you an example, I, I spent, uh, I've been in Tucson, I should have said a little bit more about my background, but I've been in Tucson for about four years. I was in Seattle for six years prior to that, and I was in Michigan ten years prior to that. So if you notice any accents, as we put that earlier, it's the Michigan accent. <laughs> 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 or maybe the fact that I grew up in the UK prior to that, maybe a little bit better. Um, but um, so I've been in the States about 20 years, t 10 years around Michigan, so a lot of uh, my experience was automotive related. Uh, I'm not particularly a car buff, but a lot of it was, you know, automotive engineering mostly around Ford and the Ford community. Um, but for many years, the way that Ford and most of the other co car companies went about building cars was largely the same. They followed the same process, whether it was three years or four years from beginning to end. It was the same kind of process. They just cranked the wheel and turned out a different looking car. But over the past you know, couple of decades, of course, with the arrival of solid modeling and all the computer tools that they can now bring to the table, each time they sit down to do the next iteration of the Mustang or whatever it is, the tools that they have available, that, well, the processes they need to incorporate are different. So each project is becoming more and more unique. Therefore, you need better project management to be able to control that. Because you can't just you know, crack through the same 200 or 250 steps anymore. Right? You've got to manage it very carefully because it's always changing. Okay, downsizing. Um, Companies are trying to, in a sense, avoid hiring at the moment, right? So they're just trying to get, get better organized with the people they have. And so we're seeing some interest in project management from that perspective. Around the Puget Sound area, this next bullet, faster organizational growth in, uh, in newer organizations. There are, uh, not surprisingly, quite a few and biotechs, and those Companies often go along on a fairly small group of people for a while, and then they take off, or they go. But if they do, if they, right, if, they, if they manage to take off, they tend to grow very rapidly. And so they'll go from a core group of eight, right, ten, dozen people, right, to 50, 60, 70, very quickly. And so in that environment, uh, you better have some processes in place to get those people doing useful things when you bring them on board. Right? Otherwise, they'll be just wandering around, uh, not really knowing what they're supposed to do. So having good project management in place to get them working on stuff that's useful to the organization is a part of the puzzle. Increased amount of outsourcing, right? So this has been going on for, uh, for a while now. Bigger companies have been looking to, to outsource, and perhaps you know, some of you are uh, in, in indirectly beneficiaries or maybe have been uh, caught up in that in the negative side and maybe also um, able to capitalize that on the positive side. But it's all very well to outsource, whether it be offshoring or uh, within the states, the more you, the more companies though you divide your work up between, the more complicated it becomes from a project management perspective. Right? The more you've got to coordinate all these different uh, 
entities that have different processes, different people you're not used to working with, right, et cetera, et cetera. So the project management challenge becomes, right, it increases. This is one of the problems. Um, well, this is one of the problems they had with the latest Boeing uh, aircraft, right? The 787 right, was delayed for several years. One of the problems that they uh, referenced was the challenge of coordinating all the different suppliers all around the world, which they had done, they outsourced much more than they had in the past. I will just say, just make a comment about, so some of the examples I'm using are, are some of these big companies, um, but in part that's just because you, you know the name. Uh, a lot of you guys are working at smaller companies, and so sometimes I do get the, well, project management isn't something I need to worry about because I'm you know, a small company. Um, not true. Right? You need to worry about project management just as much as, if not more so, than some of these bigger companies because you have um, you know, your, your time and your resources and your money is, is as precious, if not more precious to you, than some of these bigger companies. Right? So you need to be just as organized. You might not implement some of these things to the same degree, but you need to be just as worried about schedules and scope and all that kind of stuff as these bigger companies. All right, larger organizations attempting to standardize. Um, so this is one reason, again, why we're seeing some uh, increased interest. Big, bigger companies are looking to standardize across different uh, parts of the organization. Project management is one way to do that. And that's the end? No, just uh, <laughs> And moving away from time and material type contracts to, uh, sorry, move, moving to time and material. Traditionally, a lot of these bigger companies have used fixed price, have used, they've used time material type contracts, right? Where you just get paid by the hour. And so as a vendor in that environment, you're pretty safe because whatever time you spend on the project is going to be covered. So you're not that interested in project management necessarily because, hey, what, what does it matter if you're a little bit efficient? Your customer's going to pay you a But increasingly, they've been moving to, to fixed price contracts where, right, you get a fixed budget. And so I have one particular client in Seattle that has been working with Boeing for a long time, a very good company, has been working with Boeing for a long time, most of it under this time material type environment. Boeing said eventually, okay, we'd like you to you know, switch over to a fixed price, come up with a number for the next project. So they came up with a number, let's say it was a million dollars uh, for the next project. Uh, of course, they blew the budget. They went back to Boeing and said, ah, sorry, we don't have a million dollars. Well, it turned out to be you know, closer to 1.2, so we need you know, another $200,000. And of course, Boeing said, you know, which part of fixed price contract, right, did you understand? There is no more money. And, and so that company obviously got a lot more interested in project management than they ever had been in the past. Right? So suddenly it's made some much more meaningful dilemma to their money. So, and that's something that uh, we, we're seeing quite a bit of. When I talk about project management then, um, I'm thinking about all these different aspects of management project. And we're obviously not going to talk in, in detail about all of these today, but just to give you a sense of these are the knowledge areas that we define as being part of project management, right? The scope of the project, what's in, what's not in, the time, the cost, the quality, the HR aspect of it. By the way, I mean, I get all the benefits on the people side of it. The team, the relationships, those kinds of things. Communications, risk, procurement, buying stuff, and then integration is how all that stuff works. I mentioned uh, the PMI, Project Management Institute. They are a uh, uh, non-profit organization, national organization, now international, created in 1969. They have local chapters. I mentioned PMI, get to PMI Cleveland chapter already. Uh, they also have communities of practice, so these are more virtual. And so, for instance, there's a very strong ICIS. Slide that I referenced earlier in terms of membership of PMI. So I joined PMI back in 91. Uh, they had at the time 10,000 active members. My membership number was about 32,000. If you remember, I said they'd been, they were created in 1969. So between 1969 and 1991, they had presumably only ever had 30,000 members, and at the time they had about 10,000 active members. Right. Today they have about 350,000 active members. The membership number is in about 2 million. Um, and the membership growth rate of something like that. The reason I'm putting this up here is not necessarily to say rush out and join PMI because you know, everybody else is, but more as an indication of 
that increased interest, that people are becoming aware that um, everybody, not everybody, a lot of people are involved to some degree in managing projects. Right? Even if your job doesn't say you know, project manager on your business card, part of what you do right, is manage projects. I also notice on that graph, it, it starts to spike up wildly, right? Coincidentally, with the Agile Manifesto being published online, is that coincidence? Or? Uh, I think in that case, it is it is coincidence. Mm -hmm. Although um, uh, there are some interesting things that I think we'll see over the next couple of years related to Agile mm -hmm. and um, and that how that plays out with PMI. Okay. They do have a couple of certifications. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but if you um, uh, if you're interested at all. Stick around at the end, and I can, I can tell you about it. But they have two certifications. If you're ever looking to hire a project manager, uh, you are probably going to be looking for them to have this PMP certification. If you're in the consulting business and you're looking to sort of put project management on your resume, whether it be your personal resume or the company's resume, uh, you don't want to think about having the PMP certification as something. Um, does it mean that you are a, a effective? Wonderful project manager because you have your PMP? No. Um, does it mean that you know what you should be doing? Probably yes. Right? How effectively you do it, I think that's a whole other question. But these days, um, um, for most project managers, the PMP certification is something that they, should, they probably should have. Um, CAPM certification, more of an entry level certification for those that are uh, entering the field. Okay. So we talked a bit about what projects are, what project management is. The project manager, right? This may come as a shock to you, but the project manager is responsible for the project manager. <laughs> uh, this means that if you're in charge of a project, you are the project manager. You know, whether you call, whether you call yourself a project manager or your organization calls yourself a project manager, um, I don't care. If you're in charge of the project, you are the project manager. It's only the role of project. And so project managers vary from full-time professional project managers to part-time accidental project managers. Right? Um, doesn't matter if you've had training, experience, if you're in charge of the project, right, you're the project manager. So the project manager role is often not performed by the role of somebody of the title. I think, by the way, is if I just jump back a second to this slide, um, I think if you go back here and you, you were to talk to the people who are members of PMI here, you would find that they were largely in Defense, construction, maybe IT, and that most of them were called project managers or program managers or something like that. If you look at the membership today, you will, just about any industry you could possibly think of, and some that you couldn't think of, um, uh, are members of PMI, because there's a recognition that we don't have to be putting in the building skyscrapers to be involved in doing projects. Um, and you would find that many of them don't even call themselves project managers. The, the, the account managers, you know, all kinds of different things where they recognize part of what they do is running projects. So the, I get, I'm still amazed today of the, 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 the people that I get in the open enrollment classes um, because either there's a company that does that, you know, that's what you do on a full time basis, is that? Wow, I didn't know there was anybody that actually did that. Um, or we get all kinds of people, right? So I had somebody from a, uh, a church, somebody from a uh, non-profit that helps homeless people find jobs. Um, how, how are you going to implement project management? What do you mean if somebody walks in and you do it? No, but they were looking to coordinate with other non-profits to put on bigger uh, programs and they were struggling to do that because they didn't have the right skills and so she was there to learn about how to do that. Makes sense, right? But certainly she would not be your traditional idea of what project management would be. Okay. Um, the project manager may not be more senior than other team members, right? If you're on a, on a team and you have project management responsibility, that does not mean, unfortunately, that you're bringing in the biggest paycheck. And even though we would like it to be that way, uh, it isn't the case, right? You're there to get the project done. You may have you know, VPs, directors, senior people on the team that are there to provide some sort of expertise, right? You're there to get the project done. The project manager is often not the technical lead, and certainly it isn't a foregone conclusion that that should be the case. Um, the project manager should be the single point of contact for the customer. You need to maintain that relationship with the customer. As the project manager, you need to have that big picture view of what the project is. Right? 
why are we doing it, what does it look like, etc. Um, but you also need to understand the details of what the project team needs. The other people working on the project. So um, that's not for everyone. And some people are good at big picture people, some people are good in details. And the project manager needs to both. And they do that successfully. Um, the project manager is responsible for maintaining the balance between cost, time, and quality. So one of the things recognize instinctively that you do this, even if you haven't thought about it this way. One of the things we do as project managers then is maintain, is to, is to set this balance and to maintain this balance between these various different project constraints. Right? So if you put this beautiful proposal together and you present it to either your manager or a client and they say, yes, it was great, we really like it, but you know, your timeline is nine months and we want you to do it in six months. But what they've just done then is, is, is affect, put the project out of balance and they've affected this section here. Right? So in order to get the project back into balance, one or more of these things has to change. Because you can't just say, okay, well, six months, okay, let's just, you know, we'll see if we can get it done. Wrong answer, right? One or more of these other things has to change. Either, you know, you need to change the scope. In other words, sure, we can, you, you can make a project six months instead of nine months, but here's what we have to take out. Like, here's what's going to happen. Two or the next project are just going to have to put on the shelf, that, right? Reduce the scope. And or we're going to need some more money. Sure, we can do it in six months, but we're going to have to bring in extra people, we're going to have to work weekends, overtime, right, in order to compress the schedule. And so, sure, you can do it if, uh, if you have more money. Or there's the people, right? We need more people. Or let's have a discussion about quality. Maybe we can uh, produce a, a product or a service in six months that isn't quite the same quality as it would be in nine months, right, but we can get it done in six months time. Is that an acceptable solution? And the answer to all of these may be, or to many of these may be no, but these are some of the things you want to think about, right? And the same for risk, right? Is there a way that we can uh, achieve a six month time frame by perhaps increasing the risk on a product? By perhaps, maybe we don't interview as many stakeholders, maybe we don't do as much testing, um, right? Again, the answer to that may be absolutely not. Maybe that's one way we can bring it back to the balance. Right? So before we, we begin the project in earnest, we want to make sure that we have this, this balance achieved. And then as the project progresses, one of our challenges then is to maintain that balance as the schedule slips, for instance, right? how do we manage those other constraints to get the project back into balance? Okay. So the next bit of the presentation is going to walk you through the, the this basic project management process. And um, this is uh, one of the PDFs that uh, we can email out and or you can download from the website. Um, and um, this, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I find this a, a useful way to visualize the process. Certainly there, if you were to and look at their uh, text of how to do project management. There's a lot more in that than is represented here. But I find this a useful uh, way for, for us to discuss the project management process. Um, so that we're going to spend a bit of time going through it. First of all, you'll notice some different colors here. Uh, this is what we call the initiation portion of the project, where we're defining what the project is and getting pointed in the right direction. This green stuff is the planning. This is the execution or monitoring control phase of the project. Right? So you notice the um, uh, cycle here, and then finally, this is the quote. So what I'm going to do briefly then is uh, go through each of these steps, uh, show you some of the tools. Obviously, we don't have a lot of time to go into how to do some of, a lot of these, but I'm going to show you some of the tools. Um, and then assuming we have time, I'm going to come back and talk about the project charter in more detail, and we can look at the examples. So it starts with, it wants with, Realize we have this project to undertake. Who, who's going to be on the team? And uh, who's going to help us plan this thing? That's the team. And this may not be just people in your organization, right? There might be vendors, there might be customers, right? But, but who are we going to bring together to, to plan this out? In smaller organizations, it's often the same people, but the roles will change. Okay? And on the last project, I was a project manager, but this time you're going to be a project manager. Um, so it's, it's even if it's the same people, we need to think about what role they're in. 
And the first thing we need to do then is get some clarity on what the project is and why we're doing it. And so that's when we're going to write this project charter, and as I said, I'll come back and talk more about this um, at, the, at, the, uh, at the end. But this is, if, if, you, if you take nothing away from today's presentation other than this, it's that you need to have a good definition of what your project is before you get into the detail plan. Okay. So, All this, uh, this, what would be green here, um, uh, is, uh, this, is the deep, this is the plan, right? And what we don't want to do is we don't want to get halfway through here only to find out that all this good planning we've done was based on some assumptions that we got wrong, so we have to redo it all. Or worse, once we're into the actual um, execution. So this, this point here, this is the, the piece that most people do a poor job of. A lot of project problems arise because they didn't have a clear understanding of what the project was um, and why they were doing it up front. Okay, so I'm going to talk more about that later. Um, but that's a project charter document. That will help you think about, okay, do you have a clear understanding? And when I ask that to most people, uh, they say, yeah, we have a clear understanding of what the project is. Right? But when we do this in class, I then say, okay, well, what is it? And uh, they tell me what it is. And we can have about a 20-minute discussion then about all the questions that they're not clear on about the scope of the project and why it's being done, etc. Et okay, all right, so we'll come back and talk about that. Let's assume that you've got the project charter, you have a clear understanding of what the project is, some of the assumptions and those things that go with it. Um, now we're entering into the green here, so this is the detail planning process. And the first thing you need to do is what's the detailed scope of the project? Let's not jump into schedules or costs or anything like that yet, right? What's the scope? What needs to be done to get this? So the, the technical term for this is defining a work breakdown structure, and you break down the project into its constituent pieces. Um, so if this was a software development project, for instance, this might be, okay, well, we're going to, I don't know, but let's say we're going to do a new website. So uh, the total project is implement your website. Well, we have a design piece we need to do over here. Let's say we're taking a, a, a non-agile approach to getting this done. Uh, we're going to do some design, we're going to do some design over here, and we're going to do some implementation over here. So in design, we need to uh, design the look and feel, and then we need to design some detailed pages. Um, and over here, we need to you know, implement agency. And we take each block and we break it down until we get to a level of detail where we're comfortable that we have sufficient detail to be able to control the project. One of the what one of the sheets that you may have, project, looks like this. Uh, if you have that, you can take a quick look at that. Uh, that's an example of what structure. This this one is happens to be for an infrastructure deployment project. Right. That's an example of how you might want to break down a project. Uh, you'll notice here, or maybe you won't, but there's no sequencing here. There's no dates here. Right. This is just talking about what's the work that we have to do to get the project. Just, uh, who here has ever? Yeah, so I guess the one question is, are they all like, I see you have all like verbs here, build this, yes. Build that, do yes. that, yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. This is a work breakdown structure. Uh, okay. So I usually advise people to, to every box there should have a verb in the box. Okay. For a number of different reasons, but, uh, but yes. So you are developing, designing, stealing, right, whatever it is, right, there needs to be a verb in there. Who here has uh, used Microsoft Project at any time during their lives? Okay. okay. Um, so, if you've used Microsoft Project or something similar, uh, on that left hand side of Microsoft Project, you've got that indented list format. That is how you represent your work breakdown structure in Microsoft Project, right? using this indented list format. I like the graphical representation that I just showed you because it's more visual. Uh, people can get their minds around it a little bit easier, more easily. Um, but in Microsoft Project, we can't do that graphical representation very easily. Uh, so we use this indented list format, right? So we've got 
The build foundation is broken out into prepared ground and core concrete. Prepared ground is underneath that, we have rent back over deep hole. Right, so you can see how this is very similar to the hierarchical breakdown, the graphical one, but it's just more of a text based right, in the list. Uh, the other thing I'd say about this is that you can represent any work breakdown structure with an indented list, but not every indented list is a valid WBS. Right? Okay, so if you're a Microsoft Project user, I would strongly suggest you, you go back and, and if you're using it right now, look at what you have on the left hand side of the Microsoft Project and think about does it really make sense? Is it a valid work breakdown structure that describes the work of the project using verbs, etc., etc., the complete scope of the project? All right, so here we are, we're thinking about, okay, what's the work that needs to be done in this hierarchy so that uh, it makes it easier rather than, I mean, the alternative to this often is if we just have a big long list of tasks, right? And uh, it may seem like a, a sort of a, a hardly worthwhile effort to, to change from just a list of tasks to this hierarchy, but it comes with a whole bunch of benefits, trust me, even though it seems like a very simple change. For instance, it's very difficult to spot the two or three things that are missing on that list of 200 items, right? When I'm just looking down that list, right? But when I have it in that hierarchy, it's a lot easier to spot the two or three that are missing, right? Because that one doesn't have anything below it, right? Or if I just think about that area of the project, right, it becomes more evident. Uh, so that's one advantage. Um, so, okay? All right, so that's the work of the project. Then we need to think about, okay, now we've defined the work of the project, how are we going to get it done? And then, so this is the sequencing phase. This is where we need to think about, uh, for want of a better word, a flow chart, right? uh, what we would call a network diagram for how we're going to get this thing done. Uh, we know that there are certain things that we need to do up front. Right? We know there are dependencies. Right? Um, and so we structure the work that we've already defined now, we flow it out, uh, and we think about, not, what, not when necessarily, but the order in which things have to be done. Okay? Um, you're going to find that as you move from this work reddit structure to the network diagram, you're going to find you've missed things. Um, you're going to find that you need more detailed uh, descriptions than you had in the WBS. That's fine. Right? This whole thing is a very iterative process. It's not just a one-way view. You're going to go back and, and repeat yourself and refine um, uh, frequently. So here's an example of a network diagram. I'm not going to go through it in detail, um, but I will point out a few characteristics of this, which is a relatively small network diagram, but you can see how we've, we've thought about the dependencies uh, flowing from left to right. right? Uh, in terms of the shape of this thing, you'll see that every box, apart from the first one and the last one, has lines coming in, at least one line coming in the left and one line leaving the right. right? So apart from this one and this one, right, there's always something that's driving the beginning of something or something that needs if there isn't, if you've got things hanging off or in isolation, then, then why are you doing it? I mean, if, if, if there's no other step that's waiting for it, why are you doing it? Right. Even if you tell me, well, it's just something I need to do and then give to the customer at the end of the project, well, that's fine. And then tie it into the end that says, you know, collect together all the stuff I've done, wrap it in a bow and hand it to the customer. Well, it needs all those pieces to come into it. Right? Okay, so everything should be tied together, right, so that we we have all those dependencies. And then I can, not only does that lend itself to what's going to come next, which is discussing the schedule, but it's also going to be a communication tool where I can walk people through the project now and describe to them how the project is going to be. Today, because tomorrow may change, right? But this is our view as how it's going to be done today. Right? Then we're going to work through that say, okay, for each one of those boxes, how long do we think it's going to take? And by we, I mean you. And you, the person that are going to do the work. Right? Because I'm going to put on each of those boxes a responsibility and a duration. So who's going to do it, and how long is it going to take you to get it done? So for some people, this is a, a bit of a paradigm shift, because they may think that, well, I'm the project manager. I should be telling everybody how long they have to get it done. Wrong approach. Both because you, you're going to come up with the wrong number, uh, plus you're not going to get any buy-in from them, right? Because if you tell them, well, oh, you've got 10 days to get it done, it's surprising how often it's going to take them left. Right? But if I ask you how long do you think it's going to take to get done, and you tell me 10, right? 
I've got a lot more leverage when I go back after eight days to say, you know, you're the one who told me you thought it was going to take ten days. We're eight days into it. What do you think? It's going to be two days. I mean, obviously, it's still right, but at least you have a little bit of leverage right, uh, to go back. So you, you always want to be having them provide the estimates. Build your schedule from there. Okay. So we're going to have each one of those boxes. Who's responsible? How long is it going to take? Then we can take that information, whether we do it on paper or if we're using Marcel Project. Marcel Project will do this for us, and I'm not going to go through the exact calculations, but we can use that to develop a schedule. And since we know what the work is, we know the dependencies, right? How the thing has to be sequenced. We know how long each one of those boxes is going to take. Right? There are some calculations that either we do or Microsoft Project does for us, right, where we can do what we call a forward pass, backward pass, right, and calculate when these things have to happen. Now, then we're facing the situation of, okay, according to this, we can get this done by day 40. Right, well, the customer wants it on day 30. Well, that's a problem, okay, but at least we now know how big a problem we have. And based on the best information that we've got from our team, we're looking at 40 days. What are we going to do to be able to bring it back to 30? Because the, the approach that most, honestly, most often people take, right, if they're not familiar with this approach, is they say, well, let's see, uh, this is the, uh, what we have to pack into the day, right? So if the customer wants it in 30 days, we're going to chop it in pieces, and I'm going to say, all right, you've got three days to take to do your thing, you've got five days to do yours, you've got eight days to do yours, you've got two days to do, you know, right, guys, let's go get it done. You have no idea how big a pickle you're in. Right? You don't know if you just ask people to do it. Then we can work to bring it back. Right? Maybe we reorder things. Maybe we go back to somebody and say, I know you told me 10 days, but um, that's really causing us a bit of a problem right now. Right? Is there a way that you could put you know, your, your better guy on it? Is there a way that you could dedicate a little bit more time to it? You know, is there a way that we can get you a faster computer? Whatever, you know, can we get that down in seven days? We can. Can we put some things in parallel or we'll put it in, in series, right? We can have some discussions about how to compress the time and, and see if we can get it back to 30 days. And of course, we may not. Right? I mean, at the end of all that, we may get it back to 32 days and we have to go back to the customer and say, you know, I can't do 30 days. 32, I'm reasonably confident that 32, if you can just give me the two extra days, we can get it done in 32 days. Right? Can you get, and here's why. I'm not just, you know, waving my arms around saying, you know, oh, well, that's, you know, that seems kind of quick. Here's why it's going to take 32 days, right? And that's why we're comfortable 32 days is a big number. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen these kinds of things, right? These Gantt charts, right, coming out of Microsoft Project or something similar. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of information packed in here. One of the, the nice things about this particular uh, Gantt chart, the way it's formatted, is that we can see um, not only the, well, the current forecast, Right, which would be the, these uh, blue and red bars. Right? This is the, the plan, if you like, as the schedule as we know it today, based on the latest and greatest information. But these black spiky bars represent the plan that we all agree to up front. So as the blue and red bars move based on the latest information, right, the, black spiky, the black spiky bars don't. That's our baseline. Right? So we're always comparing where we are now to where we said we, we would be. Right, so you can see that this project has slipped to the right. This was my project, and as a professional project manager, you understand, of course, none of my projects run late. <laughs> they may slip to the right somewhat, but they never, but they never run late. Um, so this has slipped to the right. Um, a lot of these are currently scheduled to happen later than we had originally predicted. And in fact, if you were to look at detail, you would see that we're scheduled to finish pretty much on the same, the, 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 the correct date. Right? Even though a lot of them are slow. But we can do that comparison and do some analysis based on that. Make sense? If we want to uh, and we need to, we can add on here cost and resource information if we want to get that sophisticated. At this point, we can go back to the stakeholders and say, okay, here's our project plan. Uh, is everybody on board? Can we get this done? Does it meet our needs? Right? If we want to get their buying. And then we enter in that blue cycle now, right? So we now have a, a project plan, and we enter into this cycle of typically weekly. We publish the plan. So in other words, okay, here's 
the planet as we know it today. Um, but the, the one thing that we know about the plan and the schedule is that as soon as we put it out, it's going to get out of there. Now, this is another common mistake that people make, is they, they come up with a fairly reasonable schedule, which they then laminate, put on the wall, and say, okay, guys, meet this schedule. Well, things change. People do stuff early, they do stuff late, right? So we need to get out there on a weekly basis <coughs> and find out what's going on, collect the progress information, right? Um, various ways we can do this, but we need to find out what's going on. Right? Since we last met, what's happened and what happened? What are some of the issues? So we collect the progress information, we analyze the current situation. Where do we now have concerns? What do we need to tweak? We adjust the plan, perhaps manage some change, whether that be internally driven or customer driven. And then we publish the plan again, right? the new version of the plan. We collect the progress, right? we analyze. So we end up going around this cycle here, as I say, typically on a weekly basis. Sometimes more frequently, sometimes less frequently. Right? We go around, around, around that, right, until we fulfill right, all the tasks on the project, to which one we're done, right? So we may have a team celebration, we document our lessons learned, we record what are our actuals for future projects, future reference, okay. and then we're done. Okay, I said I would take a deeper dive into the project charter. We don't have a lot of time, but let me do that. Um, does everybody have, or can they see a copy of, actually I can bring, We've got some more on the, on the table over there, too. Okay. okay, the project charter document. If you remember, I said this is a document that we should be writing day one of the project, essentially, right? So when you, when your customer says, when your manager says, oh, you know, you're now the project manager for the ABC project, you need to know what that ABC project really means and how to put a box around the city manager. And so, um, you need to, whether you call it project charter or not, you need to write something like this. Now, you may have seen some sort of project definition uh, documents in the past. They tend to focus um, a little bit too much on what the scope of the project is and not on some of these other things. So these are the kinds of things you want to be thinking about. And there is also an example of a completely one of these floating around somewhere that we can also email. Uh, first of all, what is the project? So the project is, uh, let's say, this, uh, we're, we're going to create a new website for the ABC by the way, this, this completed chart, charter should be a page or two at most. This is not a detailed project plan. This is a short document to make sure we're all on the same page before we do the detailed plan. Okay. All right, so it's the uh, mission is to develop a new website for a customer agency. Uh, objectives. Why? What are we trying to do right, as an organization or as a company? Uh, what are we trying to do? Are we trying to make money? Are we trying to establish a strategic relationship? Right? Are we trying to make the customer money? Why are we doing this project? Right? And why, are we, why are we doing that? So what's the objective? What are you hoping to achieve? The deliverables, what are we going to have at the end of the day? Right? So the most obvious one, the most obvious deliverable is this website. But are we also responsible for training? Are we also responsible for documentation? Right? What other deliverables are we on the hook for here? Right? That's what we need to document here. Stakeholders. Stakeholders are who is involved in and or impacted by the project. Right. So the most obvious stakeholders, okay, who's actually going to be involved in developing this website, but who's going to be impacted by it? Is it the general public, other employees of the company, the marketing department, the technical people who have to update the technical sections of the website, maybe? Right. Who all is going to be impacted and affected by this? Just because we put them on the list doesn't mean we're going to spend a lot of time talking to them, necessarily, but it might. The danger is the way most people get themselves into trouble is they don't think about all the stakeholders until it's too late. Right? And then suddenly they find out that, oh, the marketing department wants to have an input into this design and we've already started thinking. Oops. Now we need to go back. Right? So, stakeholders, who's involved in it and impacted by the project? Roles and responsibilities, who's going to do what? High level WBS. Right? So, at a very high level at this point, not the detailed stuff that we looked at earlier. But at a very high level, what are the five to ten phases of this product? What are the big steps you're going to go through? Well, there's going to be design, implementation, test, redesign, rollout, something like that. Right? Assumptions. What assumptions have been have been made about the project? What assumptions are you making about the project before you embark on the project? Because you can bet that there's a whole lot of assumptions that are 
floating around about what this website is going to look like, what it's supposed to do, what it's not supposed to do. Let's get them down on paper. Communications. How is the team going to communicate? Are you going to meet regularly? Do you have some SharePoint, Google Docs, right? How are you going to communicate as a team? Which relates to this other one down here, documentation, right? Where are all the documents going to be? But in the middle there, we've got risks. What could go wrong on this project? What have people been talking about already? Right? This is only day one project. Oh, well, you know, this is the third time we've tried to you know, launch this website. And the last two times it failed because of this one. Okay. Like, you know the marketing department really you know, uh, is, is swamped with work right now. You're never going to get approvals from them in a timely fashion. Well, these, are, these are risks, right, that we can start to document to make people aware that these are going to be challenges on the project. Boundaries. What's not in the project? infinite number of things that are not in the project. Yeah, but what might, this is all about setting people's expectations. What might people think are in the project, but is in fact not in the project, right? So let's say training is not part of the project. Right? We can put that in the back section. Right? Or, um, what else for the website? Um, you know, this, this project is only to take us through the initial launch. The ongoing revisions and population of the hundred different technical, page, the technical pages, that's all going to come back. To help us draw a box around what's in the project and what's not. Uh, the, the decision making process, right? How is the team going to make decisions? Um, you know, not all teams. Um, we talked about, okay, with the project manager, maybe making more project management decisions, the uh, technical lead, more technical ones. But in this kind of more collaborative environment, right? Maybe there's a different decision making process where people vote. Has to be consensus. Right? How how is the team going to make decisions? Right? Because we need to document that. And then finally, signatures. Right? We want the key people to sign up on this charter document right, before you get into the detailed planning. Because a, if they have to sign it, they might actually read it. And if you actually want them to read it, um, right? Because you do want to get their buy-off and approval. This is really the project that you're about to invest time and effort in. Um, and because you want them to sign this piece of paper, so that you know a month from now when they come back and say. Well, why does the project you know, look like it does? You can you know, hold up the project charge and say, remember this. And you agreed that we were not going to do this, and we were going to do this. So if we can get signatures, so much better. As I said, there is a, an example, one of these uh, complete floating around. Um, so take a look at that. And it's difficult to write the charter. Right? This is some of the pushback you get. I mean, writing a two-page document, right, you can whip that out in an afternoon, an hour. But yet somehow, miraculously, it seems to take time to do that in most organizations. Well, why does it take, why does it take time? Because you don't have the data, you don't have the information, you have to go get it. You have to talk to people to get the information. That's what takes the time. But if you don't have the information, you don't skip over it and say, well, it's too time, let's just get on with the detail planning. The point is you don't have the information, right? How are you going to work on a project where you don't have answers to these questions? Mm -hmm. So go get these answers, right? It will be worth your effort. Trust me, right? To get the answers to the question, get it down on paper, get everybody on the same page as to what the project is and what the risks are and so forth. That will make your life smoother from this point on, right? So if you remember, when we went through this very quickly earlier on, I said if you take one thing away from today's lunch, it was this. Right? Just spend the time, even if you don't do any of the other stuff about schedules of WBS or whatever, even if you just spend the time to write a good project charter, this will alleviate a lot of problems on Shared good understanding of what the project actually is. A couple of references for you in terms of further reading. This uh, project management for dummies. You know, I know some people don't like the dummies series, um, but uh, in terms of very everyday language, the project, man the project management for dummies it's twenty bucks or less. Um, it's written by a PMP, so the vocabulary is uh, very much in line with what I've been using today. It's a good book to have on your uh, your desk as a quick reference to what should I do next. Uh, this one, this uh, Kirshner book, is a well-known book, but it's you know much thicker, it's more expensive, it's more of a college text. But if you really want to get into the more formal project management stuff, right, that is another good reference. So project management for dummies and the Kirshner book. Okay. Are those like texts for certifications? They're not, actually. No. They're not. Uh, there's, a, there's a something called the project management body of knowledge. Which oh, is right. Right. Yeah, that all right, so that brings us to the end.
which gives us precisely minus three minutes for questions. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if we want to take a couple questions maybe here as a group, and then I'll be happy to stick around and answer any, any questions. Uh, Yes. I'm kind of curious where um, publicity fits in with it. I, something I've noticed with a lot of projects, especially in the advent of social media, is that um, publicity sort of trickles out as a project's working on to sort of help build buzz and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, I, and, and I didn't see a lot of that. Is that considered separate from the project? Shouldn't be, no. No, I mean, if, it's, if you define it, it depends on the reasons why you're doing the project. Uh, as to how significant that portion would be, but I would consider that to be part of the scope of the project. And so the better organized projects will have a communication person uh, who is assigned specifically to do project-related communications, including the kind of social media thing. So part of the, um, uh, part of the scope of the project would be that, outreach, and again, it depends on the purpose, but outreach to stakeholders. Um, I mean, a lot of projects bring about change in an organization. Mm -hmm. Right? And so that piece of it becomes, it, it is often overlooked in terms of, um, uh, you know, unfortunately a lot of projects, uh, the organization goes away, does something, and then comes back to the organization and says, ta-da, okay, now do your lives different, right, because we have this new service or product or business process, right, and they haven't reached the reels and done that communication, so, um, but it should be part of the project where publicity, relation, whatever you want to call it, is part of the work that we have to do. Not only that, but I've seen projects where that kind of communication is used as input on the project. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it affects yes. the whole scope and, and kind of what, what, thing, what you end up with. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Yeah. Both to actually impact the, uh, the reality of the project, but also to get buy-in uh, and so forth as we go along as well, get people vested in it. So, yeah. In fact, we are um, hoping to have someone from ADOC who's going to come uh, speak to one of the PMI Events fairly soon about uh, how they do that with various uh, different stakeholders. What this what this individual does at ADOT is handle a lot of the uh, different stakeholders on the road projects, and he's going to talk very specifically about how some of that is handled. Not so much from a social media perspective, but in more general sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you you uh, you mentioned at one point that not every index list is a, is a WBS. WBS. Yes. Um, I mean. Uh, certainly, I could make an indent list of all my favorite fruits. Yeah, exactly. But, but I mean, is that is that it, it, does it relate to your point that um, that that all of your your elements within the WBS like say start with a verb so that they're actions that people can. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that is that what you're talking about? Well, I'm talking about that. That's part of it. Uh, but there are other breakdowns. For instance, a common mistake people make is they veer off from a work rate structure into what I would call a product breakdown. Right. So if we talk about building a house, right, I could say, well, I need to build a house. But the first floor, the second floor. The first floor is a hallway, kitchen, dining room. My first floor, is, my second floor is a uh, uh, three bedrooms, bathroom, right, blah, 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 right? That is a hierarchical breakdown, right? It looks kind of like a WBS, right? But that's not actually the way to go about building a house, right? If we started, if we put the verbs there, we don't build a dining room, we don't build a kitchen, right? The way we build a house is we pour a foundation, we do framing, we do plumbing, we do electrical, we do drywall, we do interior decor. Right? That's the way we do the work of the project, right? And so, what I'm part of what I'm saying is that you need those verbs. You need to think about the work of the project, not necessarily, in this case, the product breakdown. Right? So I can do a product breakdown that looks like an indented. It's, it's an indented list, right? But it's not a very good. It's not a valid WBS because we don't build the dining room in isolation. We don't build the kitchen. It, it, it does make sense. I, yeah, I, I didn't know if you had a, um, and, and that's, uh, that, that's probably, that could be enough detail, but I didn't know if you had any kind of rules of thumb. Like, here's how to know when you've, yeah, you know, do, where, where build a dining room yeah. is not valid, whereas, you know, poor foundation. Yeah, I have a, a, a if I could check this, it's about 20 questions mm -hmm. um, that you can go through that will sort of guide you in terms of um, how do you know you've got enough detail and do you have the right kind of things. Generally, the biggest thing is that verb thing. Because if you, if on that hierarchical breakdown, if you instead of just putting dining room and kitchen, if you'd have put the verb build, build dining room, build kitchen, most people would have hang on, you don't actually build the kitchen. That's usually a good trigger for most people that hang on, and this isn't the way you actually do it. And get back into the process. Um, as you mentioned, though.
So part of the issue there is how do you get timelines or schedules for stuff people don't know or need to figure out? You know? Yeah, right. That, that's yeah, because question. like I read some studies that were like if you have to do something the second time, you're yeah. about 50% faster because yeah. there's not these gray areas of stuff you don't know. Like if you're a programmer, like, oh, learn the language or get better at it so that I can do this particular yeah. task. Right? I mean, I was the real, um, the real challenge is where you, you know, where you're looking for somebody to be innovative or creative. R&D project, you know, particular where you know how, how long is it going to take you to right, make that yeah. discovery? Or building a kitchen, or you know, cleaning appliances, because that's pretty much a known yeah. kind of yeah. task. Yeah. That, that's true. Um, so there are. Um, uh, it's a good discussion to have, right? Okay. And, and there are, right, and there are various things that we might be able to do. I and mean, if it's truly uh, innovative, you know, once in a lifetime kind of thing, that, that is really difficult. Often. We rely on the experience of the individuals to give us a most likely best scenario. Right. Right. And or, or put another way, do you like have requirements like if you're working with a client and you can't agree on the high level charter, like you just can never get sign off on that? Do you just say part ways and just say you can't define your project or you can't get all the players on board, so I'm abandoning ship? You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, that, 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 that yeah, concept I've had to do that particularly, but, but, but okay. yes, that would be the. I mean, it, you know, if you can't get into you know that basic of an agreement as to what the project is, then, then yes. Then it's, yeah, it's bad for everybody to exactly. get farther. Right? Exactly. Yeah, I, I would say I have not taken that approach, but I avoided getting in, pro you know, getting involved in projects where that has been the case, right? where they, they haven't been able to get that basic level of agreement. So I've been. Okay. And uh, have you ever, like, you've obviously managed lots of projects, and some of them are very large. Have they ever ended? Has one ever ended early? Uh. I mean, generally, you know, the, the, uh, the one of the things PMI does is they have a project of the year uh, award, and uh, and so you know some of those you read, oh yeah, they finished you know twenty million dollars in the budget and six months early. Um, have any of the projects I've worked on rarely? Yeah, mine too. So anybody? It's like, but at, um, have they but have they finished on time? You know. And the other thing is that, that um, in my uh, world, on time, uh, on time is on time is it, right? <laughs> exactly, right. Yeah. Uh, if you meet the and, and something else to, to think about is, is um, we could have a whole discussion about managing people's expectations mm -hmm. and um, the importance of that, right? And so we talked about managing balance. And that's a big part of it, and managing expectations is another, is another part. And so delivering when people expect, right, is is so the date may move, right? But if, if people are kept up to date mm -hmm. on that early enough, mm -hmm. then we're delivering to their expectations. Right. Okay. Right. Where we get ourselves into trouble is the day before, the week before we're supposed to deliver, we suddenly say, oops, it's going to be four weeks late. Right. Uh, if we, at the beginning of the project, are able to say, I don't think this six months is realistic, and the customer's saying, well, 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 I don't know, and we say, well, I think you know, this is a more realistic date, we're going to do our best kind of a thing, mm -hmm. we're at least managing those expectations. Mm -hmm. um, and just one last question for yeah. me. Do you show your customers, you know, estimates and timelines using some kind of online tool like Rally or one? I just noticed you didn't speak about particular tools. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And you uh, actually built your own here. It's like, you know, like uh, well, for some of the templates and things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I personally tend to create exactly what I want. You know, using whatever tools. Mm -hmm. I do have sort of a standard toolkit, right? right. And, and send people PDF files by email. Yes. Wow, that's how you talk to all the. I tend to, yeah, because players, because uh, the PDF files are locked down, right? They they're very simple for me to look at, right? They haven't got to log in, they haven't got to do anything, right? Yeah, yeah. I guess it's different for us in IT. We expect you just live online. Right, 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 right. Well, I mean, you know, I might post them somewhere, you know, Google Docs or something, uh -huh. but but I and they can't change them either, right? Which is the other advantage. Right. Because right. if I open up, a, you know, if they're allowed to access stuff. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Then not necessarily, right? But you have to be careful. That change things, there are some advantages to that in terms of having them be able to change things, but typically I'm too much of a control freak and so I don't need changing things, right? So I want to lock everything down, I just want to send them a PDF, which is a pretty picture, and that, right. that's it, right? A very narrow, uh, often very narrowly focused PDF file that isn't, you know, the schedule for the entire six months, right? But this is what you're Your working part, on yeah. for the next two weeks. Right? Okay. Right. So you're keeping the big picture. 
really want the big picture, here it is posted out there somewhere where you can get to online. Okay. Um, but, uh, but I don't need you sending me out to you every week because you won't care. Right. And in fact, not only do you not care, but you won't even open the file. Yeah, you start to get hunt through oh, six pages. Right. Okay. All right, very good. Well, I'll be sticking around if you do have. Uh